But it's the kingdom, the truth in the kingdom is always the truth. So before Jesus even said, the last shall be first, that's the way God works. The last shall be first. So he goes and picks the run of the litter. And, and, and the Spirit of God says to Samuel, anoint him. So what happens? So, uh, Samuel anoints David king, right? And so if you read in Psalm 23, it says that you anoint my head with oil. So I'm reading that one day. And, the whole, and Jesus says to me, Adam, I never anointed David's head with oil. And I'm like, what? He's like, Samuel did. But when he obeyed my voice, David saw me and not him. That's ministry. I'm going to say that again. God tells Samuel to anoint David. Samuel obeys God. And Jesus gets put on display through Samuel's obedience. He didn't say, Samuel anoints my head with oil. The greatest prophet in all of Israel. I got a word from such and such or so and so. But ministry was birthed from listening to God and partnering with Him. Does that make sense? Amen. All right. Are we okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want to share with you a little bit because we're on a journey of discovery. Bill Johnson says it like this. God is not hiding mysteries from us. He's hiding them for us. And the way we move in the kingdom is God reveals something. The only way that we uh, wisdom is established in the kingdom is through revelation. Because the, wit the wisdom of God is hidden in a mystery. And so what that means is it takes revelation to tap into the, to, to the realm of wisdom. So whatever God reveals to you, it doesn't only belong to you, but it belongs to your children. So every time I write a book, the revelation that I receive in that book is not, is not only mine, but it's the inheritance of my children. So that means the finances that come from that book also, in a sense, are going to be for my children. But not only in the natural realm, but in the spiritual realm. The revelation that I receive belongs to my children. Meaning, God expects my children to walk in the revelation that I have. <laughs> Which means they'll get more, naturally. So it's like their, 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 their bank account, in a sense, in the spirit, before they're born, is already full. In the kingdom, it's more about inheritance than about earning things. A lot of people, um, they want to earn. This is what religion will do. Religion will try to make you earn what God has already given you for free. Most people are trying to ask God and trying to cajole God into giving them what He already gave them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after a few concepts and then I'm going to talk more about sonship. You'll hear this in church. This is a good one. Um, I'm seeking the Lord. Okay? It sounds good, but the Lord is not hiding. The Father was completely revealed in Jesus. Jesus told us where the Father is, where the Father looks, where the Father waits, how the Father desires to reward, that it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not sell you the kingdom, not you earn the kingdom. I have a friend of mine who's a wealthy businessman, and he, he used to look at the scripture about the pearl of great price. And he would look at the scripture, and he would get freaked out like he was going to have to sell everything. And for someone like this guy, that would be a huge deal. And I said to him one day, I said, hey, just relax. I said, all of your money and everything you have can't buy the kingdom. The pearl of great price is not about a man selling everything he has to purchase the kingdom. He doesn't have enough to purchase the kingdom. It's about Jesus coming to purchase us. That's what, but what happens is when we, when, we don't, when we don't have a kingdom perspective, what happens? Everything becomes about us. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. There was a person uh, in the Bible, a woman, and she had a spirit of infirmity for 38 years. And she was bent over the whole time. Guess what she could see? Herself. And that's all she could see. That's what selfishness will do. The moment she got free from herself, the first person she saw is Jesus. One of the things that God wants to free us from, not you, I said us. One of the things that God wants to free us from is selfishness. Because I'll be honest with you. I'll be the first one to be dead honest with you. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm selfish. Yeah, and God wants to rid us of that so that we can have access to what we have and to what we've received in the kingdom. God gives mature sons an inheritance. He doesn't give immature sons an inheritance. 
God is maturing us so that we can receive what we're asking for. One time I said to me, Lord, why aren't you going to give me a breakthrough? And he said, you're not ready for the breakthrough that you're asking me for because you couldn't stand under the temptation that will come after the breakthrough. So Jesus is 12 years old, and he goes through this process of maturity. He's 12, and so it's, it's basically in the Jewish culture, it's, his, it's a bar mitzvah. He, and it's the age of accountability. It's the age where he is now held accountable for what he knows. And he walks into the temple at 12, at the age of bar mitzvah. And what's interesting about the Jewish culture is the Jewish culture celebrates maturity. Okay. Yeah. There's a word for us in that. All we celebrate is when lost people, you know, get fire insurance. Yeah. Or if someone gets healed. But one of the things God is going to teach the church to celebrate is maturity. Yeah. We don't celebrate elderly people because we look at them as a task. And we don't celebrate maturity because most people don't handle maturity well. They think they've arrived somewhere. But maturity is not about arriving somewhere. It's about becoming something. And so Jesus, 12 years old, he walks into the temple and he goes there and he, he has a grasp on who his father is. Mary and Joseph come back. They left Jesus in church. There's a revelation. Some of you believe Jesus in church every Sunday. Okay, Jesus, see you next Sunday. <laughs> so they leave him in church and then he doesn't apologize to them, right? He's like, he's not like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, that you left God in church. He's like, didn't you guys know? I would be about my father's business. Now, this is a bogus statement. It's borderline arrogant. I'm telling you, that's how it would be perceived by anyone in all culture. A 12-year-old kid talking to his parents like that, and that culture was not even heard of. But he wasn't being disrespectful to them. His security and his understanding and his confidence in his relationship with his father would seem like arrogance to those that don't have that same confidence. Confidence looks like arrogance to insecure people. I get people that judge me all the time. They're like, you know, I think you're an arrogant person. And sometimes I can be arrogant. But they're like, you know, I thought you were an arrogant person. I have that New Jersey thing going. I got the hair thing going. I kind of, people like look at me like, you know, this guy's an arrogant guy. But then they get to know me and he's like, he's not that arrogant. But they judge me, right, after the flesh. See, the scripture says, Paul says that we know no man after the flesh. Do you know why he said that? Because the people who related to Jesus after his fleshly identity were cut off from the supply of what he had to give them. They said, isn't this the carpenter's son? They were offended at who he was in the natural, and it cut them off. Their dishonor for him cut them off from what the father wanted to give them through his hands. If you don't honor people for who they are, right, you will not receive from them what you need. Right. I'm so hungry that I'll just honor you because I need something. I'm hungry. I want, I want to press into the kingdom. So, like, let's say that you're not a perfect person. That's okay. If you have something to offer me that's from the Lord, I'll receive it. Often we want, we want a, an amazing gift and an amazing package, but a lot of times God gives an amazing gift, not in an amazing package. Look at John the Baptist. That was God's gift to humanity. John the Baptist was the greatest man who, who, who was born of a woman. He's the greatest man ever to be born of blood. I mean, that's, that's, that's really amazing. But what happened? He didn't talk like them. He didn't walk like them. He didn't eat what they ate. He didn't wear what he wore. He wasn't looking to be relevant with them. He wasn't looking to have friendship evangelism. He told them, repent, you bunch of snakes. There was people getting baptized, and he says, not them. Those are snakes. I mean, this guy was totally radical. God gave him the assignment to announce Jesus. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist was preaching, and as John the Baptist is preaching, Jesus walks in. That's a great message right there. I'm preaching about Jesus, and he shows up. I'll sit down. You know what I mean? That, that's a pretty amazing message. That's what prophetic ministry is. Prophetic ministry is to declare the Lord, and he manifests himself. And so, you know, John is preaching. Jesus shows up. Now I'm going somewhere. And, and Jesus turns to John and says, John, it's time to fulfill all righteousness. You know why he says that? I'll explain to you why. Jesus came to fulfill the law. 
In the law, it states that Levites must consecrate lambs for Passover. And it's, it's also in the Jewish culture that they would consecrate a lamb for Passover and the family would become familiar with the lamb that they're going to kill. They would come to know it by name. They would have a relationship with it. And then it would pay for their atonement. Exactly what the Jewish nation did. They, they came to know Jesus. They knew his name. They saw his works. They saw what he did. And then they killed him. And so... He didn't, his life wasn't taken. He, he gave his life. But during that time, you hear the father audibly profess, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Heaven opens and the Spirit of God comes on Jesus and there's a family reunion between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of the River Jordan. Then from that place, Jesus' ministry, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. Here's a good one. The reason he had to be led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted is because he had no lust to draw him aside. The Bible says in the book of James, when a man is tempted, he is drawn away by his own lusts. Jesus had no lusts. Therefore, the Holy Spirit had to lead him into temptation because there was nothing in him that would connect to temptation. He said, the devil is coming for me, but he has nothing in me. This is pretty, you know, this, this is radical. Who Jesus is, is totally radical. And so Jesus went from a young kid saying, I must be about my father's business. He's 12 years old. He has a firm grasp on who his father is. He tells his earthly father and mother, I must be about my father's business, which is a radical message in and of itself. Because he was basically looking at Joseph and saying, you're a carpenter, I'm not going to be about your business. <laughs> Even though he did work for his father. You know what's interesting about Joseph? Joseph was willing to take the reproach that came with Mary. And because he was willing to pay that price, out of all the people on the planet, Joseph spent the most time with Jesus out of any other person who ever walked the face of the earth. From sun up till sundown, which is 12 hours a day, six days a week for 18 years, Joseph spent with Jesus. Because those who are willing to take a reproach are willing to enter in. To an intimate relationship. There is a reproach that comes with walking with the Lord. There is a reproach that comes with healing ministry. There is a reproach that comes with being passionate and going after God 100%. There is a reproach. That's the way it is. Imagine how it looked for Jesus' healing ministry. His, his earthly father dies young. That's great healing ministry. It's like really exciting. Put posters up. His dad is dead. He has to take care of his mom. Jesus is coming to town. The guild is sick. Right? You don't think about that. But that's the reality. Jesus wouldn't have told John the Revelator to take care of his mom if his dad were still alive. What happened? Joseph died early. How does that look for Jesus' healing ministry? Not too good. Sometimes there's a reproach. And, and sometimes we, we, want, we want healing or we want a ministry we want something on the outside but sometimes we're not willing to pay the price and I really believe that as we mature the price is not even worth considering because what we're receiving is far greater than any price we can pay because what we've been given is priceless does this make sense yeah. Jesus said some really radical stuff and he ministered he didn't minister uh, for approval. He ministered from approval. He ministered from a place of rest. That's where we have to learn to operate from. I have this prophetic friend of mine. He's this really big guy. And he's such a character. He'll be singing, you know, a horse swallowed a fly, a swallow, you know, he's just singing. And he's just this, he's really a character. And he'll stand up. And he'll start prophesying. And three minutes later, there'll be bodies all over the floor, people going crazy, sometimes demons freaking out, all kinds of stuff happening. And I'm like, Lord, I mean, this guy probably hasn't prayed in like two days. You know, I'm like, how, you know, how is this happening? And the Lord said to me, Adam, he ministers from rest. And so, like, me being here, I'm not here to perform for you. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to minister to you, to be a blessing to you. I'm here to, to reveal what I know about Jesus, to encourage you, to push you forward. You know? But God is renewing our minds. And 
I get to help in that process and I'm really grateful to that. So here's another thing like we hear. I mentioned that we hear, you know, I'm seeking the Lord, but he's not hiding, right? That's kind of like church language. Here's another one. People say, we really need revival. You ever hear anyone say that? You ever hear people praying for it? Okay. That is the same thing. It's like we actually don't need a revival because nothing in the kingdom is dead. There was a fountain that was opened up on Calvary. That fountain has flown from that day forward. <clears throat> there is a, a, a river that makes glad the city of our God. Why? Because of where the river began and who the river leads to. There is a river that makes glad the city of our God. There's a river that flows from the throne and of the Lamb. Meaning we don't need a revival, we need an alignment. We need to learn how to position ourselves to receive from the life of God and to give it away. Now you're saying, well, Adam, what you're saying is just language. It's just, no, it's not. It's religious mindsets that have to change because we put a salary cap on our own experience and on the experience of the people in our city because of our religious thinking. I'm not beating you up. I'm saying, if we would learn to think differently, if we would learn how to think, we can see where to go. You'll also hear Christians saying, I'm seeking direction. And these are totally genuine people. I've said this out of my own mouth. I'm seeking direction. So you're telling me that you're lost. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So now, where I'm, what, you're like, you know, where is this guy coming from? All right. I'm coming from that if we want to have an upgrade in our experience, meaning if we want to experience what the scriptures promise and say is rightfully ours, we need to change the way we think. The issue is not a heart issue. Here's another religious thing people say. Well, brother, your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And I go, it was. And then I got born again. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And now it's a heart of flesh that's bent toward righteousness. Yeah. Hey. I know what it is to be wicked. I know what it is to sit at night and plan how you're going to get someone the next day. I get the MO of wicked people. And I'll tell you, I'm not wicked. Why? Because Jesus came in. Woo! Right? So now I'm born again. So now it means that I used to have a bent toward immorality, toward perversion, toward lust, toward women, toward drugs, toward money. Now I have a bent toward Jesus, toward the poor, toward the nations, toward the assignment, toward my wife. You, you see what I'm saying? My bend now is, is totally another way. So I'm, I'm like hardwired to do what's right. So it's like I have to try to do what's wrong. And then when you try to do what's wrong, you really won't get that much pleasure out of it. Anyone ever been there? Amen. As a Christian, try to, I used to be a really good sinner. I mean, class A sinner. And I had fun sinning. People say, you know, why did you do it? Did you have a bad family? <laughs> no. My dad was my baseball coach. <laughs> You know, I just wanted to do drugs and sleep around. I mean, you know, what don't you understand? You know, it's like, didn't you read it sin for a season? It's like fun? It's like, yeah, I had fun. I didn't have a bad childhood, so I'm trying to escape. I'm not trying to escape anything. I mean, that's what people think, you know? And so, but, but what happened is Jesus comes in, and now he, he hardwires us differently. And so we need to learn how the new creation works. Because the new creation is a whole other ballgame. One of the other day I was praying, and the Lord said, actually no I wasn't, I was just sitting there. And, um, <laughs> the Lord, <laughs> and, I, and the Lord said to me, Adam, the new creation has no breaking point. And I'm like, what? He said, the new creation has zero breaking point. People say, you know, like when they get mad, they say, ah, you know, I got mad or I did this or I did that. Yes, it was you, it wasn't the new creation. The new creation is only created for good works. The new creation is the part of you that knows how to respond to the presence of God. Paul talks about a war that's in us. And I believe that there shouldn't have to be a war in us any longer. Because Jesus defeated sin and death. 
and the war should be over. There wasn't a war in Jesus. We're in him. He defeated what used to be our slave, our slave owner. You know. And so we have freedom in him. Which means that we're not free to do what we want. We're actually free to do what he wants. See, Jesus, it's what Jesus knew about the Father that navigated how he lived, how he spoke, and how he, and, and, and how he operated. Jesus would say, repent, you know, or change the way you think, because what? The kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Because he knew the heart of the Father. What's so amazing about the mind of Christ is the mind of Christ knows the heart of the Father. The mind of Christ perceives the Father's MO. Jesus steps into every circumstance ready to display what the Father's like. You ever hear Jesus said to Philip, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's radical. That is, Jesus went as a boy to, I must be about my Father's business, to, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, you see the difference? In that, I mean, that's a really radical statement. You know, I look like a fat version of my dad, or whatever, and so sometimes when I go places with my dad, I go, you know, if you've seen the Father, you know, if you've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, and he laughs. But the reality is, I know what my earthly dad is like. I know what he does when he wakes up. I know that, at, you know, he starts, I hear this noise, bang, bang, bang. And I know that what he's doing in the morning is, he's grinding his coffee, he's making fresh coffee. And I know when he goes, bang, bang, he's taking the coffee and pouring it into the coffee pot. So that he can pour water into it. And then press the button. I know he's going to go sit in a green chair. I know that he's going to read his Bible until the coffee's ready. I know my father, right? So I know what he's doing. 